From COIN6, your local election headquarters, this is the debate for Portland City Commissioner. Welcome to the 2022 Portland City Commissioner debate on COIN6. I'm Ken Boddy. Tonight, we have two candidates vying for position number three on Portland City Council as one of four commissioners and the mayor. Let's introduce tonight's candidates. Joanne Hardesty has held the position three seat since her election in 2018. Before that, the Navy veteran worked as a community organizer, including serving as president of the Portland branch of the NAACP. She is the first black woman elected to Portland City Council. Her challenger, businessman Renee Gonzalez. Gonzalez has spent his entire career in Portland after graduating from Willamette University. He opened his own law firm in 2012 before entering the world of politics in 2020 when he led an effort to reopen schools during the COVID pandemic. The rules for tonight's debate will rotate questions from our panelists and we'll also have all the candidates answer some of the questions that you sent in. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to answer. So let's introduce our two panelists. First, longtime Coin6 reporter Lisa Balink. Lisa has covered a lot of politics over the course of her career and has interviewed countless political candidates. And from our partners at the Pamplin Media Group, Portland Tribune veteran reporter Jim Redden. Our first question tonight comes from Lisa Balick. It will be for both candidates to answer, starting with Joanne Hardesty. Lisa? Joanne, the mayor just rolled out his plan to reduce homeless camping on Portland streets. Last night, hundreds of people testified before city council about this, especially the hot button of forcibly removing campers once they're given options and time to be able to leave outdoor options as well as indoor options at some point down the road. Do you support forcibly removing campers and criminal penalties at a certain point? Uh, the magic question is at a certain point. As you know, the mayor's proposal in my mind is not moving swift enough to deal with the crises on our street. I will be providing some amendments to actually speed up the timeline that the mayor has put in place because here's what I know. What I know is until we have places for people to go, uh, we cannot ban camping. And so what that means is we have to expedite finding places that the city currently owns to house people who are houseless, who have to actually invest with our county uh, partners and use space that they own. I'm amazed that the plan did not call for identifying properties right now that are sitting empty and actually being able to utilize those. There was uh, two words that were missing from the mayor's proposal. There's one thing the city can do right now. We have one superpower and it's called eminent domain. And we could actually repurpose some land now and make it accessible and available for people who are houseless. Mr. Gonzalez. I'm in general agreement with the direction mayor's going. And I think it's inevitable that we're gonna have to confront those who refuse to take shelter that is offered. But I do want to emphasize there are segments in our unsheltered population that need to be treated differently. For example, there are segments in our population that have legitimate reasons for con uh, concerns and going to low barrier shelters. For example, mothers with children, there can be compelling reasons why they don't feel safe in a low barrier shelter. We need to meet them where they're at. On the other end of the spectrum, there are criminal elements that are have entered our unsanctioned camps that are engaging in the worst types of crime, everything from drug trafficking to uh, human trafficking to high level and low level uh, theft, car th uh, catalytic converter thefts, car thefts and bike thefts. You know, we need to disrupt the cycle of criminality in some of our unsanctioned camps. And so uh, I'm directionally in agreement with the mayor and just recognizing there are different segments and some we need to take with direct earnest action. Thank you. Our next question from Portland Tribune reporter Jim Redden and uh, Mr. Gonzalez will answer this one first. Renee, if Multnomah County is not willing to go along with this plan, would you be willing to pull the city's funding from the City County Joint Office of Homeless Services? Yeah, thanks for the question, Jim. And just a reminder to our listeners, over the last few years, the city's put between 40 and 50 million into the Joint Office for Homelessness. Right now it's running around 45, 46 million. Uh, I think the goal was venerable. We can not address the challenges of the unsheltered and homelessness and the underlying causes of addiction and mental illness without working in collaboration with other government partners. I think most people are in agreement with that reality. That includes both the uh, county and the state. 
and to a certain extent Metro. Having said that, the city has arguably not gotten a decent return on its investment of that 40 to 50 million. There has been an overemphasis at times on what has been interpreted to be the housing first model at the county level and in the joint office. And it's asked Portlanders to wait way too long for direct action on unsheltered, cam on unsheltered camps and unsanctioned camps. So I, I would like us to work as collaboratively as we can with the county, but yes, we have to put on the table pulling those dollars back and investing it directly at the city level. Thank you. Commissioner Hardesty. Let me just say that the term joint office is an oxymoron. Uh, right now, uh, because of my leadership, Commissioner Ryan now has the ability to renegotiate the intergovernmental agreement that the city and the county signed. When I got to the city, I asked, what do we get for the dollars that we're investing in a joint office? And many times the answer was, well, that's not a city issue, that's a county issue. Well, not if we're giving you 40 to $45 million a year. It is certainly a city issue. What I will say is that we need to be good partners. We cannot be fighting with the county or with the state. And because of the relationships I've built over decades with the next governor and with the legislative leadership and the county board, I think we're going to be well positioned uh, to bring everyone to the table. I wish the mayor had said, I'm going to convene a group uh, after the November elections that will include the new mayor, the new county chair, and the city, and we'll collectively come up with a plan. Unfortunately, that did not happen. It's time for our first viewer question for the candidates. Each candidate will have a chance to answer this one. And our first question comes from Rue Booty in the Laurelhurst neighborhood asking about potential rent controls. He writes, if you had your way, would you cap the rents that landlords can charge or would you allow the free market to determine rent pricing? Uh, Commissioner Hardesty, you answer this one first. The free market is creating a crisis that we're experiencing today. Econ uh, salaries are not keeping up with the cost of housing, food, gas, uh, electricity, everything. And so we did that at the city of Portland. When I first got to the city in 2019, uh, Commissioner Udaly actually had developed a, a rent control a proposal that we passed that limited rent increases to 5%. Now we're finding out that some people's rent may go up up to 50% because of some uh, uh, language uh, in the law. Um, so yes, we must cap rents and we must make sure that we're not pricing working people out of the city of Portland. Many of my employees today cannot afford to live in the city of Portland and this is the city that they work, worship and play in and they cannot afford uh, to, most working people cannot afford first last security deposit to move into a market rate unit today. Mr. Gonzalez. You know, rent controls are one of those many policies that, that have been adopted at the city and state level that have venerable goals, good intentions, trying to assist ten, uh, tenants and renters, but they have unintended consequences. Rent controls often lead to underinvestment in multifamily and further housing stock and have long-term detrimental effects on the marketplace for tenants. So again, while the goal is venerable, it has d devastating unintended consequences. And I would much prefer that we focus on things like rental assistance to help tenants that are going through big transitions in their cost, uh, that we're supporting them as a society in that, through, in that avenue without disrupting the ability to landlords to continue to invest in new housing stock, recover their investment, and reinvest that in more st housing stock. There are also a, 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 a number of opportunities for addressing long-term affordability in the region. Uh, we need to stay focused on adding the 20,000 units that the mayor has outlined, and I think that's going to be more effective long-term. Thank you. The next panelist question comes from uh, Jim Redden, and Mr. Gonzalez will answer it first. I'd like to I shift the topic to uh, crime. Um, on October 5th, uh, the Bison Coffee House in the Cully neighborhood was vandalized right before a have coffee with a cop event. And the goal appears to have been to prevent that event from happening. Uh, wondering what your candidate's reaction is to that event and whether uh, either of you would promise to attend such an event in the future should you win election. Mr. Gonzalez. Well, in terms of attending events with police officers, our public safety officers, our public safety 
uh, professionals, absolutely. I mean, what, one of the big challenges in recent years, both the defund movement and really the defund rhetoric that's come out of City Hall has been deeply detrimental to our, in our ability to recruit and retain high quality police officers. And to get ourselves out of this real crime epidemic that we're facing in our city, we're going to have to partner with our public safety professionals. So embracing them, working with them, simultaneously addressing the issues of police accountability, but confronting our crime issues head on. I interpret that event, the vandalism that occurred, as pure political intimidation. Unfortunately, we've seen this way too much in recent years. Uh, Dan Ryan's off at home was vandalized five times. Our campaign office has been vandalized. Uh, and it's deeply unfortunate. It's the reality of the rhetoric and the uh, culture of the city of Portland politically right now, and it needs to stop and be addressed head on. Commissioner Hardesty. I have worked with 12 police chiefs and six police commissioners in my time, so I won't do anything different after I'm reelected. I will continue to work with the chief and the deputy chief, and in areas that we agree, we will work cooperatively together. And in areas where we disagree, uh, we, I will continue to make sure that we're building a police force that works for all Portlanders. To me, it's important that we have a police force that when we call, community members aren't concerned about whether or not they're going to be injured or harmed when those officers show up. We are now in the 12th year with the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, and I have been with the Department of Justice Settlement Agreement from the very beginning. So we need both. We need police officers that work well as community uh, 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 crime fighters, and we also need police officers who, who are, use constitutional policing practices uh, to do their job. Lisa Balick, you have the next question. Uh, there are a lot of people who don't feel safe walking in downtown Portland day or night. Businesses keep moving out, hotels deeply discounted. What would you do to change this? even temporarily with the upcoming holiday season and the downtown businesses desperately needing those dollars. Commissioner Hardesty. Let me say that every business in the city of Portland has suffered uh, severely over the last few years. Um, and what we know is that downtown is never gonna be what town, downtown used to be. We have to reimagine what downtown will be. When I first moved here, People of all income levels could live downtown. Our creators could live downtown. We are forcing out small businesses who are being priced out of downtown. Um, and most of the commercial properties that have been built in the last three years are unaffordable for Portlanders. And so we need a different model. We need downtown to represent all income levels. We need the creative staff, a uh, creative community. We need musicians, people who work in those hotels and those restaurants and those sporting venues. Uh, we don't care about where the workers live. And I ask people all the time, well, where do your workers live? And they give me a blank face. We need to make sure that your income does not determine your zip code in the city of Portland, and we've not done a good job of that. But the question actually, though, was what would you do to make it safer in the next couple of months, specifically, so people would feel comfortable coming downtown to shop for the holiday season? Well, let me just say I'm downtown just about every day. I understand people's concern. I see houseless people. I see people suffering from mental health issues. And there is no magic bullet. We're not going to immediately get people mental health treatment that they need. What we need to do is find people safe places that they can lay their heads at night. I, there's no magic that's going to happen in the next couple of months that people will get mental health treatment, alcohol and drug treatment, housing they can afford to live in, and first, last, and security deposit, right? So I, I don't have any magic answer because there's no magic answer to what we're going to do. The reality is, is that we are still in economic decline for so many Portlanders, and they are slowly trying to come back, and we, we're not back yet. Mr. Gonzalez. Yeah, you know, I look at our downtown with sadness, and uh, it, it used to be, pre the pandemic, a source of tremendous civic pride for our Portlanders. Whether you worked or lived downtown, we looked at the, the success, the revitalization in the 70s, 80s, and 90s as a true source of civic pride. So the reality that we're facing downtown with more and more businesses moving away, nonstop crime and vandalism that drives away businesses, that drives away visitors, it's, I look at it with sadness. So in terms of what we can do with urgency there, uh, in the short term, 
upping police uh, patrols of areas where we expect shoppers to be. And we've got to make it feel safe uh, for people to be in the space. Additionally, we've got to look at the transit into the city. This is an area of really declining confidence among Portlanders. Will they be safe and will they be in a clean environment when they're taking transit into downtown? I think those are two things we can do right away. I do think we can up patrols of some unsanctioned camps on the sidewalks there to make it more accommodating for visitors to downtown. Thank you. This next uh, viewer question relates to this very issue. Uh, and this is from Mishi from Aloha. Uh, she says we met a couple who recently came to Portland as tourists but cut their trip short because of the mess they found. They could not believe the chaos and wanted to know what happened to the beautiful city. How should I have answered and what specific plans do you have to restore the city for folks to feel safe and want to visit? This does relate to what we've been talking about, but Mr. Gonzalez, this gives you a chance to expand upon that. Yeah, well, let's look a little bit more medium term outside of the short term. Again, we've gone through a crisis. We locked down hard during the pandemic. We had riots. Uh, we've had an explosion in our addiction crisis. That's a big causes of why and how we got here. In terms of how we get out of it, we do need to establish a sense of public safety and cleanliness that has just evaporated in the city. Uh, I'm a big fan of reinstituting municipal court that will address low-level crimes, including vandalism, car thefts, uh, and uh, low-level property crimes, just to reestablish a sense of safety and justice in the city. I do think there's an element of a criminal justice investment. We need adequate police officers and jail space. Those are more medium term investments. But we also need to all collectively recommit to establishing the social fabric. So much of our, so many of our institutions were disrupted during the pandemic. So many of our cultural and spiritual organizations were disrupted. We need to lean in and embrace them again, get them going again as we reemerge from these difficult times. Thank you. Commissioner Hardesty, how would you answer Mishi from Aloha? I would say I can understand how someone who hasn't been in Portland in a while would come downtown or go any part of Portland and go, what happened? And what happened is a failure, uh, but the failure didn't start with the pandemic. The failure, as you know, we're under the third mayor that declared a housing emergency, and we're still acting as if we've got all the time in the world. Um, it is amazing to me that uh, I understand because I, at riding public transit every day, walking my neighborhood in East Portland in places with no sidewalks, no streets, uh, not a lot of trees, um, I see what, what those visitors see and I see it up close and personal. And what I would tell them is we are on our way back if in fact we're able to get the resources that we need to take care of our most vulnerable people in this community. And that would mean working with the state. I've already asked our state legislators to take a billion dollars of those funds that they're going to send back in a kicker and, and use it for housing that people can truly afford to live in. The term affordable housing is an oxymoron. If it's not at 60% of area median income, workers cannot afford to live in that housing. All right. Uh, Lisa Balick uh, has the next question. Um, taking a look at leading by example, um, I guess my first question um, going here to uh, Joanne Hardesty, you're in your office a couple of days a week and the staff also same thing, most days you're not at City Hall. Is it time to be back in City Hall and lead by example and require people to be there to show the support for downtown? Well, let me say we are leading by example by actually understanding that work life has changed radically for many people. Just like other major 500 corporations who are re-looking at the workplace, we know workers want a different experience. And so we are leading by example. What we're doing is actually looking to make sure that folks that have the ability to work remotely have the tools they need. Those who have to show up every day, I have firefighters, I have maintenance workers that have never had a day off since COVID. We have to make sure that we're finding incentives to actually help them uh, remove the barriers for them to be able to go to their jobs every day. That includes providing childcare, transportation assistance for public transit, and some other uh, incentives for those employees. I think that's how the city can lead by example, not assuming that a one-size-fits-all approach will work for anyone, especially in this new employment environment that we're working in. Mr. Gonzalez. 
You know, as your city commissioner, I will be downtown five days a week unless I'm doing on that day constituent outreach. It is essential that we lead by example in the city. Taxpayers have invested substantially in upgrading our office space for our Portland workers, and it largely sits empty. Uh, this was a substantial investment made by all of us. And so as a commissioner, I'll be there every day. I'm gonna require my direct reports, the six to seven folks you'll hire in your office, that you are in the office every single day unless you're doing constituent outreach that day. Um, as you get down into the rank and file, there are, of city employees, there are some trade-offs in terms of the, finding the right balance. If, you're, if you are constituent facing, if things like permitting, uh, where it's so important to be able to talk to somebody in person, I'm gonna push for uh, largely returning to full time for those folks, or at least the majority of time downtown. There are some other positions that I think may lend themselves to continued working from home, but it needs to start at the top. It needs to sit, start with city commissioners and their direct reports, and I will be there every day. You may know that 90% of uh, permits happen online that actually don't happen face-to-face, -face, haven't done face-to-face -face for quite some time. Yeah, but it, it, go ask a developer or anyone who's going through the permitting process in the city of Portland how that's going. It's a disaster. Our permitting time continues to expand. Uh, those, including those who are trying to build multifamily housing, they're trying to add, add housing stock to the city. They find the city's uh, approach to this downright awful relative to our neighboring city. So uh, online permitting process from a couch is not working, it's deeply ineffective, and it's continuing to contribute negative, negatively to our housing stock in the city. Uh, Commissioner Dan Vine and Commissioner uh, uh, Maps have been working on that for the last two years. So. We'll move on to our next question. All right. uh, Jim Redden, you have that next question. Well, I've talked to numerous uh, home builders uh, over the years who will no longer even try to build housing in Portland for a variety of reasons, and not just the permitting, but the high cost of uh, imposed upon them by the city. System development charges and other fees uh, really are driving up the costs of construction and making it harder for them to produce a reasonably priced product. What can the city council do to speed up the, the development of more affordable housing for more people? Mr. Gonzalez, you answer this first. Yeah, so several pieces here. Let's start with system development charges. A good idea when first introduced, the idea is that you have, you require developers to contribute to the investment and invest in uh, things like our sewer and water when new housing will tap into those uh, resources. I think we found that the marginal cost to society of one additional home utilizing those resources is much less than we used to think. And so I think we take a hard look at system development charges in the city, and particularly at a time when we're simply not building enough units in the city of Portland to stay commensurate with population growth. I think that's an easy one we can really look to take, uh, cut back. Per permitting fees in general, I think we should be looking at everything we can do to reduce costs there. But the bigger challenges I hear from developers are that uh, sometimes uh, some of our zoning requirements are excessive, including some of our parking requirements, even some of our biking requirements at unnecessary costs. And I, we've got to do everything in our power to reduce the time it takes to get a permit through the process, as well as the design review process. Thank Commissioner you. Hardesty. I have recommended and continue to advocate that the city actually land bank all the land that the city currently owns. Restrict development to 60% of the area median income. Because again, we're not just pricing uh, 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 residents out of, uh, out of their homes, but we're also pricing small businesses out of the city of Portland. If the city does not do that immediately and then partner with the state and the, uh, uh, the, this uh, metro and the county, we will no longer be a city where working people will be able to afford uh, to live and to flourish. Um, that's what we have to do. We need bold pictures, not actually helping developers get richer. Developers have created the problem that we're currently in, and developers are not the ones that are going to get us out. If we use the same tools we've always used, we're going to get the same outcomes we've always got. And if we strictly development to 60% and work with our community nonprofits, we could start building those 20,000 units now on land we already own, and it would be a lot cheaper because it would be on land we own. 
Now to our next viewer question. This question comes from Eric Welford in Northeast Portland. This will be the last question before we take a two minute break. Eric writes, what is something that you admire about the other candidate and why? Commissioner Hurst. Oh God, me first. <laughs> uh, I guess I admire the fact that he's been able to break the rules and not actually be held accountable for it. It's kind of uh, an awe as someone who actually gets scrutinized quite a bit to see someone who doesn't care about campaign finance limits, doesn't care about re uh, taking uh, free de freebies from developers. Um, I, I, I don't know that I would say I admire that, but let me just say I'm in awe that someone could go through a whole campaign and, and not play by the rules and then not be held accountable for breaking the rules. Mr. Gonzalez. Oh, Joanne, uh, <laughs> you know, I appreciate her bravery. I uh, appreciate that she speaks what's on her mind. Um, and, you know, she, uh, J Commissioner Harsey resonates with the segment of our city. Um, so I tip my hat to her on all, for all of those reasons. With respect to, you know, my lease, which she seems to be alluding to, it's been heavily scrutinized by an administrative law judge and determined that we're paying fair market value for that lease. So, uh, and concluded with overwhelming evidence that that, that is true. So, um, but nonetheless, let's talk about Joanne. I think she's brave, I think she's direct, and I think she does resonate with a segment, although I'll, I'll be a, a shrinking segment of the city. Thank you. Well, that's it for the first half of our city commissioner debate. We're going to take a two minute break. We'll be right back with more questions and answers for the candidates.